The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting live from the UK and across the world online, you're now listening to the UK's only live alternative late night talk show, and I'm Kevin Moore. For the next three hours, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On tonight's show, I'll be joined by Susan Axis, who calls herself the Gap Coach because it's her mission to help you choose the gap between who you think you are and who you really are. Now, that's coming up on the second half of tonight's show. The phone lines will be open on the second and third parts of each interview for you to interact with our guests. We are live every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday from 1am to 4am British Summer Time. And that's Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 8pm to 11pm Eastern Daylight Time in America. To start the show, I'm joined by Anthony Perk, who offers a new paradigm of existence and backed up by the latest radical discoveries in neuroscience, quantum physics and consciousness studies to deepen our understanding of consciousness and the nature of reality. Anthony is a member of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, the Scientific and Medical Network and the Society for, Physica for Psychical Research. He has to date written six books and contributed to chapters to a handful of other books and has been interviewed by national and international journalists alike. Anthony, welcome to the show. Hello, welcome to be the, be here. By the way, the surname is Peak, P-E-A-K-E. -E. I don't know who Anthony Perk is, but he's probably better and more talented than I am. <laughs> he's, your, he's your past life, don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, Anthony, it's great to have you uh, on the show, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, so late uh, in the, uh, in the uh, early hours of the morning. Um, some fascinating research that you've done, some fascinating books. Um, we're going to sort of, uh, I think, sort of concentrate uh, most of this first part on um, probably on, on uh, near-death experiences. Okay. Um, but to, to begin with, I mean, what, what's, what's motivated you to go in this direction of the work that you do? Well, I suppose I've been fascinated by um, non-standard phenomena since I was very, very young. Um, I, many, many years ago, began reading a part work called Man, Myth and Magic, which came out in the late 1960s in the UK. Um, but it's only in recent years that I've had the opportunity to, to start writing about the subjects that really intrigue me and uh, effectively my first book started off as an explanation for the phenomenon that is popularly known as deja vu uh, and I was looking for an explanation of that sensation we have um, regularly in our lives where we suddenly sense that we have experienced something that we are now experiencing at some time an indeterminate time in our past and effectively, the first book was was an attempt to explain that phenomenon in a scientific and a neurological way, but in a way that um, did explain the phenomenon in the sense that it does in some circumstances seem to feel precognitive, in the sense that you feel that not only are you living this moment again, but you also know what's about to happen as well. Yeah, and... Um... I came across, is it your, your seventh book, The Man Who Remembered the Future? Is, is this one that you, is this a new book coming out? Or is this one that's, that's already out? This, the, the Life of Philip K. Dick? 
Yeah, the, the, the man who remembered the future will be released in the UK and in the USA uh, in early November. And this is um, effectively my review of the life and work and experiences of the American science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, because um, I suggest in this book that, that uh, Philip K. Dick was effectively writing about his own life in many of his uh, novels and short stories. Um, and particularly if you have watched some of the movies that have been based upon Philip K. Dick's writings, such as Minority Report, uh, Total Recall, um, The Adjustment Bureau, these are all based upon Philip K. Dick's stories. And one of the, 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 the standard things in his books is the idea that certain individuals are, pre are precognitive in the sense that they can see the future. And I cite example after example in Philip K. Dick's life after interviewing quite a few of his associates and friends uh, and having uh, access to some fascinating material uh, supplied to me by his, um, his last wife, Tessa, about the events that took place in um, Mar February and March of 1974, uh, where he had what he called his theophany, which was quite incredible, where he really started experiencing the most peculiar things which he wrote about for the last six or seven years of his life in an extensive um, series of writings called The Exegesis, which were published around about 18 months ago. But it's really quite intriguing. It's quite a, 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 I'm taking a very different angle to the life of this guy, and a lot of people are really quite fascinated as where I'm going to take it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, a, a, a really fascinating author and, and, a, and a really uh, unique angle that you've, you've got with, uh, with his work as well. And I think it's, it's, it's all fascinating. Does this drive you crazy sometimes, this research that you do? I mean, I mean, I mean d d is it difficult for you to remain centred, you know, knowing some of the knowledge that you are, are saying is your truth in a sense? Well, effectively, I stay centred in it all because um, I'm I'm not uh, the kind of individual that necessarily has um, unusual experiences. I very much tell the stories of other people who've had strange experiences. I mean, effectively, sometimes I have curious synchronicities happen in my life. Sometimes I have um, short-term precognitions or precognitive dreams that come true, mm. but effectively nothing to the level of um, the experiences and stories that people from around the world have, have written to me about uh, since my first book is the life after death was published way back in 2006 where i've literally received hundreds and hundreds of letters uh, from people who read the book and actually said and has said to me that you know you're writing for the first you're the first author that's explained in any kind of detail in a scientific grounded way yeah the experiences they have because the most important thing for my writing is that um, I believe that extraordinary claims need extraordinary proofs and it was something put forward by a guy called Marcello Truzzi many many years ago and I very much work upon this so my approach is always scientific in other words I, fo I follow through with the science and then into the experience but you don't need to these days to, to, um, to look too far to find the incredible because you just need to look into the findings of quantum physics uh, and some of the latest findings in neurology and consciousness studies to make you realize that the interface between the human brain, human consciousness and external reality is far more complex than ever we could ever imagine it being. And indeed some of the, the latest research in particle physics and cosmology are very much telling us that the universe and consciousness are very much entwined. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, you know, it, it just, uh, you know, the more I've got into this work and the more, you know, people I've interviewed in these different subjects, it's, it, you know, it, it, it does take an effect on you sometimes where, you, you know, you, 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 yeah, you just think, well, OK, you know all this, but how do you apply it into, in, into your life? Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I'm asked many times, what is the point of my writing? And I always turn around to say, and say to people that effectively, if you're, you're looking for a guru and you're looking for somebody that's going to be able to tell you how to live your life, I suggest you go and, and look towards other people because there are many, many gurus out there that claim that they have all the answers. I don't. I'm a searcher in exactly the same way as my readers are searchers. And in many ways, if you read my books and you know a little bit about my background, you'll realize that I'm writing about my own search. So in many ways, people sometimes have criticized me because they've said, well, Anthony Peake's position has changed over the years. 
Well, it hasn't changed. What it's done is I've, I've, be, I've learned more and I'm more aware of, of scientific facts and scientific research and scientific discoveries. Yeah. So therefore, I am not trying to prove anything. In other words, you know, I don't have a belief system and therefore I'm trying to justify that belief system by writing about it. What I'm doing is I'm literally saying to my readers, look at this, this is the information, this is, this is the, the research. And indeed, if you read my books, you'll find that I, I carefully cross-reference every single reference back to academic papers and I always say to my readers, please don't take my, 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 my opinion on this. Go back, read the papers yourselves. That's right. And if you feel that my position or my interpretation of the facts is somehow in error, come back to me and we'll discuss it. And indeed, I have a very, very active Facebook site and I have a very, very active um, international forum whereby we discuss these topics. But, but you, um, must feel, you must feel very fulfilled with the work that you do. I mean, it must make you feel fulfilled. Totally. You know, effectively, you know, there's something called the Maslow hierarchy of needs and the highest level of that is self-actualization. And effectively, I feel totally self-actualized in the sense that I really love what I do yeah. and I get so excited about it. And if you watch my YouTube videos, and you watch my lectures, you will, you will see that I become extremely animated because it really does excite me. And it excites me because we are dealing with the greatest mysteries. I want to know what it, what I am in my head, how it is that um, a few pounds of um, jellied material in my brain with electrical impulses in it create the concept of being Anthony Peake with all my hopes, my fears, my memories and my anticipations. It's something that um, neurologists call the hard problem because the hard problem is how effective in an inanimate matter creates Anthony Peake or Kevin Moore and all your thoughts and feelings and everything else. But the great mystery is that effectively you can never really prove you're conscious. You can never prove that you have anything. Indeed, there are philosophers such as Daniel Dennett that will argue that you and I are fooling ourselves into believing that we are even conscious, you know, that it's, it's some kind of illusion, um, which is self-evident nonsense. And we, we know that because we know every second of our lives that we are self-referential creatures. And the biggest question to me is what happens at the point of death? You know, do yes. we continue or, or do we not? Yes. You know, what, what, what is the point of life? What is the point of you and I spending all our lives learning things, experiencing things, making mistakes, making errors, if at the end of it we slip into Alzheimer's or dementia and then quietly slip away to nothingness? With, to with... me, it doesn't make any rational sense. Okay. Um, I, I will say as well that uh, I saw... I've, 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 watched some of your lectures on stage i think you've, i think you're a, you're a, you're a great stage presence um, you. and 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 you do make uh, the the lectures uh, um, well i wouldn't even say the lectures it's, it's 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 really interesting stuff what you do and and, you, and you please you know if people get a chance to see you uh, live then 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 please uh, you know take the make the effort to to go do that um but that's a very good point as well. What, what, you know, what does this all mean if at the point of death uh, we just switch off like a PC or you know, it, it, there, there is nothingness? Um, does that bother you? Um, it doesn't bother me. I mean, effectively, I've spent most of my life, I'm not a religious person. Um, I would consider myself to be probably spiritual with a small s in the sense that spirituality intrigues me and spiritual experience uh, intrigues me but effectively do I have a fear of non-existence no I don't it, that doesn't particularly worry me uh, because effectively I didn't exist before I was born or I have no memories of existing before I was born so therefore it is perfectly logical to conclude that I will go back to that um, deep sleep of nothingness when I die but effectively there is too much evidence out there um, to suggest that Consciousness is not part of the brain. The brain is something that effectively acts as a receiver of consciousness and the consciousness itself is located elsewhere. So in other words, just because the uh, television ceases to function doesn't effectively mean that the studio that's sending the message out has ceased to function. And I think this is sometimes the danger we, we fall into. And the reason we fall into this is because... Um, everything gives us the impression that we're inside our heads. You know, our eyes are located at the front of our skull, our ears are at the side. Uh, we view the world from that position. But effectively, the reality of the situation is that if your eyes were located on your kneecap, you would just as easily believe that you existed, you know, a few centimetres behind your kneecap. Now, clearly, we know that the brain and conscious experience are related, 
but that isn't a similar relationship to the way in which a television set is related to the TV screen and the people you see on the TV screen. Indeed, one of my favorite analogies of this, it's rather like when we, we go into the brain to find consciousness or memories and such like, it's rather similar to taking apart a, um, a racing car in order to find speed because we're actually talking about different things, you know, uh, and we are, you know, we go to places in our dreams. Where do we go in our dreams? People lucid dream, people have out of the body experiences. You know, effectively, what do these really tell us about the true nature of reality? And uh, science can only explain all the answers when it can explain the mysteries of, of consciousness, what um, the Australian philosopher David Chalmers calls the hard problem of, of, uh, of science, because um, it is the hard problem. Yes, uh, absolutely. Okay, well, look, Anthony, we've just got to take a very quick break here. Um, but after the break, the phone lines will be open for you to speak to Anthony or share your opinion. You can give us a call on 0292-000-3666 or text your comments and questions to 07728 758 759. International listeners outside the UK may Skype the show by adding the more show live, or you may choose to interact with us on Facebook and Twitter. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and The More Show website. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. Welcome back. I'm uh, currently joined by author Anthony Peake. We are live and the lines are now open for you to call and speak to our guest or share your opinion. You can call us on 0292 000 3666 or text your comments and questions to 07728 758 759. Anthony, welcome back to the show. Great, yeah, great to be back again. Now, you know, one of my favourite bands of all time were the Ozark Mountain Daredevils, so it's great to see the Ozark uh, Mountains mentioned. Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're one of our sponsors, um, uh, Ozark Mountain Publishing. Um, never been there personally, but I get taught it's a very, very uh, uh, tr uh, you know, beautiful place to, um, to go visit, so... Um, yeah, you know, your your work is uh, fascinating um, you, you, with some of the books that uh, you've so far published. And, um, I mean, you know, Is There Life After Death? That's the title of um, of one of your books as well. Um, did you think, though, that asking that question affects the way that you live this life now? To a certain extent, it does, because if you read my first book, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When You Die... I present um, uh, a paper. Uh, I present a model of what may happen to human consciousness at the point of death, and in I call this this concept cheating the ferryman. And effectively, what cheating the ferryman suggests in very very quick terms is that um, at the point of death, we effectively live our lives again within the final seconds of our life. In other words, you you live your life again um, in like a Groundhog Day like re, re, recreation of your life, and I use the I do the physics of this, then I do the neurology of it, and I do the neurochemistry of it as to how this could be possible, um, and the model seems to work fairly well, in the sense that it's a way of explaining deja vu for instance because effectively if we are all living our lives again this would explain why sometimes we get these strong feelings of recognition when we go to places or under particular circumstances it also would explain circumstances whereby when people suddenly find that they're in a great period of danger or they're in a dangerous incident and suddenly they'll either hear a voice in their head or something will warn them to avoid the danger um, and effectively, in my second book, The Dime, the, the Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self, I actually cite many, many examples of individuals from around the world, some of whom wrote to me after reading the first book to say that they had indeed had these experiences where 
sometimes even their bodies had physically turned them off the road just as a lorry was coming down the wrong side of the road and would have been a direct crash. Now, one of the major issues with this concept is that if we are living our lives again in a three-dimensional matrix-like recreation of our lives, can we change it? And I argue, yes, we can. And I very much take the, I, I present an argument which I've put through in various of my later books, suggesting that, that we're effectively living in a, a computer simulation. We are, we are effectively existing within a computer game. And within the computer game, programmed within the computer game is the outcome of every incident and every decision that you could make in your life. So effectively, every choice you make has an outcome. And each of those outcomes is programmed within what's what I call well, what is termed the zero point field, uh, what my associate Irvin Laszlo calls the Akashic field, the Akashic record. Now, again, this is not so mad as it sounds, because if you look into some of the latest hypotheses of particle physics, I particularly cite uh, Stephen Hawking, who in 2006, with his associate, a guy called Thomas Hertog, who's a research physicist at CERN, came up with something they call the top-down hypothesis of particle physics. And in this, they suggested that every single outcome of every decision is already encoded literally you make a decision and you collapse what's called called the wave function of that particular reality all the other realities still exist as a potential so therefore we it's reasonable to conclude that we are in this computer game so effectively now kevin if you decide if you listen to your daemon if you listen to your higher self the being that has lived your life before and knows your life before, and you look at the clues, you look at the clues that this being gives you, you can make decisions and change your life from the way you did it last time. Now, this is then very intriguing because most of us make decisions in our lives that we wish we hadn't made. Now, isn't it a wonderful idea to know that possibly you may live your life again and avoid making those decisions and avoid hurting those people or or, or going to that university or taking that job or making that journey. And that's very much what I say Cheating the Ferryman is all about. And over the last seven or eight years, this hypothesis has developed and it has become more complex, but it has become more supported by science and the work I do. Um, so this I'm very, very excited about as, as an explanator of what may happen to us at the point of death. In other words, we don't die because at the end of the second life, there's a third life and a fourth life and a fifth life. Um, so, again, it's like um, Groundhog Day. And indeed, as an interesting aside, Danny Rubin, who was the scriptwriter of, um, Ground, of Groundhog Day, actually gave copies of my first book, the American edition, to all his friends because he said this guy's actually done the science of Groundhog Day. OK, well, uh, that's um, um, a lot to digest there. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard of the the ideas of uh, f f future life, you know, future lives, and obviously past lives. Um, but you're 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 saying that possibly we we could be when when we pass on, we could live just this life again in a different uh, in a different way, doing with 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 with, with whole, a whole set of different options. But wh wh where would the soul progression be in that, though? Well, the soul progression, if you take. The, the very idea that if you take the idea of um, karma and you take the idea of progression, surely it would be better to progress as yourself, being yourself, rather than, say, the standard idea of reincarnation where you're reborn as somebody else. Because think back for a second on the idea of this. If I'm reincarnated as somebody else, somewhere else on the planet, somewhere else in another time, in another place, and I don't remember my past life, how on earth can I learn by the mistakes I made in that last life? I'm not learning anything because I suffer from amnesia. You know, I suffer from completely forgetting the mistakes I made. So therefore, there is no progression. You have to remember in some way the errors you made last time. And I think this is where cheating the ferryman actually shows that there's progression. Because what happens is, like, I, again, the movie Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. Connors in Groundhog Day lives the same day over and over again. He initially realizes he's living the same day over and again, wants to bed the girl, do all the negative things. But as he progresses living the day over and over again, he suddenly starts to do good for doing good's sake. He makes sure he's underneath the tree to catch the little boy who falls out the tree. He suddenly starts to, to, to become a much more rounded human being because he, teaches, he learns foreign languages, he learns how to play the piano. After he has lived the perfect life, 
And in fact, when I recently myself interviewed uh, Danny Rubin, the writer on this, and Danny said that he had initially planned that, that Connors would live thousands and thousands of lives, but in the end, he lives the perfect life. He becomes an avatar. He becomes a perfect human being. And when he does that, he's allowed to move on to whatever that next moving on is. And remember, all this happens in the split second before you die. So effectively, time dilates to accommodate a myriad of lives where you can follow all of your ambitions, all of the things you would like to do. Now, again, in my book, The Labyrinth of Time, I explain again how time works with consciousness, how it is a subjective thing. And I explain in great detail, a 380 page book, trying to explain exactly what time is, what the philosophy of time is, what the science of time is, what the neurology of time is. So again, effectively, you know, I don't just make these things up. You know, the, what I'm talking about, I'm not channeling it from the planet Tharg. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not talking to 7,000 year old Atlantean princesses. I'm doing this through the science. And that's what yeah. makes my work very, very different to a lot of the work that's on the marketplace. You know, go away, look at my work and see if the science makes sense to you or not. And, and would you say that the, the daemon is possibly your gut feeling as well? To a sense, yeah, it is. I mean, it's your gut feeling. And sometimes we have this gut feeling, you know, it, literally you feel it in your stomach that something feels instinctively wrong. And the reason why some people only have gut feelings is that the communication channels between the daemon and our everyday self, the Edelon, I use the analogy, the daemon is like the game player. The daemon is the person who has control of the screen. You know, you're, you're, you're playing Tomb Raider. You and I are Lara Crofts. We are Edelons. We are in the game. But there's a part of us, the daemon, who is the game player that remembers the game from last time. Because remember, when you play Tomb Raider, Lara Croft runs down a corridor, turns down a corridor, a big monster comes out and it kills her. What happens is she dies. But as far as the game player is concerned, she hasn't died. The game player just starts the game again. And this time, the game player, the daemon, knows that there's a monster down that corridor and makes sure that Lara doesn't go down that corridor at all and goes down another cover of the corridor. And over many, many times playing an RPG game like that, you complete the game. You actually get through the game. And this, I think, is what life is about. We live the life over and over again till we get it right. Now, the daemon can communicate with us but only depending upon certain neurological state within the brain. Now, for instance, there will be individuals out there who will relate to this. There are individuals who, who have something, who experience something called temporal lobe epilepsy. Temporal lobe epilepsy is a form of epilepsy focused on the temporal lobes of the brain. Temporal lobe epileptics have the most amazing experiences. The temporal lobe epileptics, many of them that have been in contact with me, their daemon is manifest in their life. It's their guardian angel, for want of a better term. It's the angel that guides them. This being is with them all the time. It talks to them. It guides them. Socrates had a daemon. Socrates' daemon knew the future. Philip K. Dick had a daemon. Mm -hmm. He called it many, many things. He called it Valis. This being guided him through his life and was precognitive. And why is it precognitive? Well, it's precognitive not because it sees the future. It's precognitive because it's already lived your life for you. So it knows what's going to happen. It's seen the movie, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, um, so how, how can we you know, get in tune with, with the daemon in, 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 as you understand it? Well, one of the uh, things I've been working with with various people over the years is ways and means that we can open up the channels of communication with the daemon. For instance, I believe you can do it with deep hypnotism. I think there are certain hypnotic states that you can, can't, can't, you can communicate with the daemon. I also believe that the daemon can be manifest in dreams. So if you can control your dreams, you can you can communicate with the daemon. In fact, uh, a friend of mine, Robert Wagoner, who wrote the definitive book on lucid dreaming called, surprisingly enough, Lucid Dreaming. In Rob's book, he talks about the being that you encounter in these states. And he said, if you can open up those communication channels, this being can guide you. But what I'm trying to do is work with various people in finding ways. In fact, there's been work done in America whereby if you blank out the, 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 the periphery visual field of both eyes, you can effectively put the Edelon to sleep and the daemon can manifest that way. There are some circumstances where people, I believe, are actually daemons incarnate as, as, as a, a normal person. 
you know, and that there are people, possibly avatars, possibly that kind of thing. But I'm working with people to find ways and means of doing this, whether we can do it chemically, whether you can do it in deep meditative states. This is what meditation about. And funnily enough, if you look at every single esoteric tradition, you look at every mystic tradition, what is it all about? It's getting in tune with your higher self. This is what it's all about. You know, this is why mystics do it. Mystics have this at one moment with themselves, atonement. This is what they do. And when you touch the, the noetic, you're actually seeing the universe as your daemon sees it. But there are, there are techniques, and I'm trying to work on these techniques because I think there's something we can do. But the argument is, are we supposed to contact our daemon? And this is the big million dollar question for me. You know, is my work taking us into areas that we're not supposed to go into? Because there are people I know whose daemons have manifest, and some daemons are actually turning around saying, Anthony Peake's stuff is really incredible. In fact, somebody told me that once when I was on LBC, they were woken up in the middle of the night and a voice in the head said, turn the radio on, you've got to listen to what this guy's saying. Now, this is just somebody told me. Whether, whether they were telling me the truth is beside the point, but this is what they told me. So effectively, there's still an awful lot of work I have to do. But my whole cheating the ferryman thing, it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the thousands of people out there that are involved in my work. And there are thousands of them. You know, this is a really international movement that we're creating now. And it's a we. It's not an I. It's not Anthony Peake. It's everybody else because people are writing other books based upon my ideas. They're writing novels. They're writing movie screenplays. It's so encompassing and it is so effectively explanatory. Yes, absolutely. Now, a number of questions for you, but we've just got a text in from, uh, uh, is it Julia? Julie in Newport. So, Julie, thanks for the text. Um, is everything just a singularity mind in higher consciousness, or do we have individua individuality after death? You're going to love my new book, The Infinite Minefield, that uh, comes out in um, on the 2nd of, 1st of October, because effectively this is where I'm taking this. What I'm suggesting is that effectively, as the famous American comedian Bill Hicks said, we are all one consciousness ex experiencing itself subjectively. Uh, and again, if you go into the, the great mythologies and the great religious belief systems, most of them are always stating that God, God is within. You are God. God is everything. Uh, there's something called panpsychism, which is a concept that says that everything that is, is God. Therefore, we are just emanations of God. We, we, are, we are a God that has forgotten he's God, and we have to do that. So effectively, one of the arguments that was put forward, uh, I have a, a group called the, Walk, the, uh, the Walker Group that meets in Liverpool. And one of the discussions we once had, uh, which I've progressed, is the idea that um, we have forgotten who we are. And God himself, God for want of a better term, Godhead is a better term. Um, or just the, the, the ground state, or even what the Kabbalists call the, the uh, Ein Sof, the, the kind of ground state of everything. It's in order to stop it being bored, it creates its own universe, and then it populates this universe with elements of itself, and then it allows itself to forget what it is, so it can live a life. So effectively, it, it, suffer, it, it, it doesn't allow itself to know things. And again, this is what Philip K. Dick wrote about in his book, uh, The Divine Invasion. This is very much what he talks about, the God who's forgotten he's God. Now, there's a lot of work being done in this area at the moment, particularly with people who work with certain forms of hallucinogenic um, substances, such as ayahuasca and dimethyltryptamine. Because effectively, when people take dimethyltryptamine, one of the things they come across is the first thing they feel is a great unity with everything. It's the great mystic experience that mystics have talked about since the year dot. As soon as you go into a mystic state, you feel that you are everything. And again, I know people who've had near-death experiences, and it's one of the first things they realize. Everything is a unity. Now, again, uh, an associate of mine, a friend of mine called Martin W. Ball, has written a book called The Entheological Paradigm which puts forward this idea from one point of view. There is another associate of mine, Professor Bernard Hayes, who's an astrophysicist, who has written a book called The God Theory. He again comes across it with exactly the same philosophy. So there's an awful lot of very, very deep thinkers that are coming down to exactly this same principle. And you've got, say, you've got astrophysicists, you've got anthropologists, you've got people who, who are involved in, in psychedelics, all are coming to the same conclusions on this. 
Okay, well, that's uh, that's really interesting what you've uh, what you've just discussed there, and that opens up a whole series of other questions. Um, but we're going to have to just take a short break, Anthony. Um, so everyone, just stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff. You're now watching The More Show. Welcome back. I'm still joined by my guest, Anthony Peak. Anthony, welcome back to the show. Hi. Now, Anthony, um, some fascinating, uh, you know, um, information you was giving us to, to us to, to myself and the audience there uh, just before the break, and um, the whole idea that uh, you know this this may be an illusion, uh, this this may be a sort of matrix that we're living in. Uh, you know, again, this has this has been touched on by by other authors, um, but but it all you know they all seem to be saying the same thing. Um, and it, you know, it, it does give you the power to say, well, well, look, you know, there could be an, an alternative to, to, to this as well. And, and this could be a truth. Um, and, it, you know, this, by embracing some of this, this, the, the, these ideas, um, we can change the way the movie goes, can't we? Mm. Yeah, that's it. Effectively, we can, um, you know, and if more people think along certain lines, you know, that there will be a groundswell whereby we can possibly manipulate the reality we live within. Um, I, I, I'm not too sure how far we can go with this because, you know, I, I'd still try to stay within the science and, you know, the, 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 what the science tells us we can do or cannot do. Um, now, effectively, I know that I cannot change the world around me, but it could just be because I'm not advanced enough. I'm not sensitive enough who knows um but effectively you know there is evidence that certain individuals can change things because if the the universe is some form of a um a super game effectively we can change the game as we progress and one hopes that that is the point that humanity collectively is evolving in some way and maybe this is the time that the evolving takes place although uh, um, as a historian i'm perfectly aware of the fact that every generation thinks it's the special generation. Uh, there will always be individuals who will believe that Armageddon is just round the corner and they are the last generation. Um, so we're no more special that we happen to exist at this time. But there does seem to be a new way of thinking. And we do have the opportunities now to use analogies by which people can understand in, in, in straightforward terms the things we are trying to describe. For instance, I would argue, I know that many of your guests talk about um, past life reviews and everything right. else. Now, if you take the argument that we're all one consciousness explaining itself subjectively, and we take into account that we're living in some form of computer game that contains everything that ever has happened, effectively it is not therefore at all strange that given if I go into a deep hypnotic state that I'm likely to pick up the memories and ideas of somebody who lived centuries ago. That makes rational sense to me. And indeed, I work with hypnotic regressionists. Um, and indeed, my next book that I'm working on at the moment is going to be um, uh, a, a part work with myself and Professor Irvin Laszlo, who, in, in, by, by the way, has actually been nominated for the Nobel Prize. I think it's twice or three times. And he and I are writing a book together about evidence for consciousness outside of the brain. And one of the areas I'm reviewing in this book is indeed past life experiences, past life regressions, mediumship, um, electronic voice phenomenon, um, you name it, all the areas of evidence to say that that humanity or consciousness survives death. Mm. Um, and I'm coming up with some quite fascinating material because I'm interviewing some of the world's leading people who've had near death experiences. Yes. Um, and I'm talking to some of the world's top mediums on this as well and asking for, 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 for proof that these things actually do occur. And it's a very, very exciting. 
interesting project. It, it is because what people don't understand is when you're around these people's energy, um, there's something different about it, isn't it? It it, re it reminds you of who you truly are with some of these people, uh, the, the potential that's that's there as well. Um, whether it's because they they come across that because because the, you know they they not only live their truth but they're very grounded or it's a number of things I don't I don't know, um, but that for, um, something you touched on there as well, which is this whole a concept of you know can you change your reality? Well, I have to say that I do think I be, I feel like I live in a universe that that will give you what you want if you know what you want. Um, but is it not true to say as well that if you look at things with different eyes, it looks back at you differently? Well, effectively, if it is the case that, and there is strong evidence from quantum physics to say that this is the case, that the act of observation brings about the reality around you. And before people jump up and down and say, what a nonsensical statement, all I ever say to people is go and just read the observer effect. It has been known since the, 19, since the late 1920s that effectively the act of measurement, or for argument's sake, the act of observation of a subatomic particle makes that subatomic particle change from being a statistical wave where it could be in one place or another and collapses it into a point particle that has location in time and space. This again is hard particle physics. This is not woo-woo nonsense, it's the real deal. So effectively, if the act of observation collapses a wave function into a point reality, We've then got some interesting ideas because there's been work done by a guy called Anton Zeilinger at the University of Vienna, who has been working with something called the twin slit experiment, uh, or the double slit experiment, which I can't go into detail now, but okay. effectively he has proven that law molecules, not atoms, not subatomic particles, but molecules, large molecules like buckyballs. Now, a buckyball is one of the largest molecules you can think of. It has 60 atoms in it. They found that buckyballs are a wave if they are not observed, but if they are observed, they become a point particle. Now, everything we see around us is made of molecules. Everything. Yep. The table you're sitting on is made of molecules. So effectively, if molecules are influenced by the act of observation, what does this say about reality? The only point that the issue is, is whether we can control this reality. And I argue we can. Um, I feel sometimes that we can create our own reality. You know, effectively, when we're feeling negative, you're about to go into a meeting and you're really nervous about it. Why does the photocopier cease to function? It ceases to function because you're creating that world around you. You're, you're giving it bad vibrations. Um, now, effectively, again, this is this is not ooey ooey stuff. This is this is the real deal. This yeah. is this is how the world functions and works. Um, and again, I suggest anybody just pick up a, a copy of Scientific American or a copy of New Scientist. These are articles being written on this subject all the time, all the time. So effectively, it means that your world and my world interact because we are creating our own worlds and we are we are sharing this world but effectively when you think about it everything that you perceive is 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 processed by your senses and it's then sent into the brain and then the brain then cre recreates it internally to give you a three-dimensional illusion of the reality that you think is external to you now effectively again this is this is intriguing most Neurologists and uh, vision scientists call the belief that the external world is what we see, they call it naive realism. This is how serious this is. Naive. It's being naive to assume that the world you see is as it really is. And I'll give you an analogy of this. The electromagnetic spectrum, the, the what is light and, 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 and everything else down to radio waves, if you actually laid that out, to the length of the Mississippi River, 6,000 miles. What we perceive as visible light would be about two and a half inches just south of Hannibal, Missouri. Yeah. That's how much of reality we actually perceive. <laughs> we talk about dark matter, dark energy. 94% of the universe seems to be missing. Now, <laughs> some people have argued that's a mathematical trick which it may be, but at the moment, the balance of the universe is wrong. There's dark matter and there's dark energy. Yes. We know it's there, but we don't know what it is. No, that's right. That's right. And um, 
our knowledge of what we think we understand is is probably very different to what what, what is out there. And Intellectual that, chauvinism, you yeah, know, it's it's yeah. the materialist reductionists yeah. thinking they have all the answers because they've given them names. Have you noticed? We've explained it. We've given it a name. No, we haven't. So many things that have been given names that we have no idea why they work or what happens. The, the, I mean, look at the brain being one of them as well. Mm. Um, you know, so. Um, yeah, I, I think it's important to to say as well that that um, li life is not always easy. It's not, and um, I think that with your work, um, it, it it sort of it it allows you to say, well, okay, um, there are there are ways of understanding why life may not be going a certain way for you sometimes, and if you embrace. Uh, some of the work that that you you cover um th there are ways of of of, of um there's no easy way out you, you you know sometimes you have to go through the hard times don't you <laughs> mm -hmm. you know um and I, th I, and I and i and i think that um you know with your work um at, at least it it, it, it tries to make scientific sense of it as well as you know of, of of you know if it is hard then then there there is a shift that can take place i think in any moment to to just at least make it understandable um but there's so many points i can go into in in, in your work as well and I, I did want to touch a bit on the um out of body experiences um and i i think we're 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 getting to the uh, the uh, the end of of this first part of the show, but um, well, very briefly, just 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 tell us a bit about your work in, uh, on researching the out of body experiences and how how this sort of connects some of the dots. Yeah, effectively, um, I wrote a book called uh, "The Out of Body Experience: The History and Science of uh, Astral Travel," because I wanted to actually discover whether, when people experience the idea of being outside their body, whether they're experiencing this in consensual reality, or whether it is far more complex than that. Uh, and in my book, I discuss in great detail lucid dreaming. I discuss out of the body experiences, and um, I, I take the position that that probably under certain circumstances we can get outside of our body. Now, in my book, I very much take the position that I'm not really sure, but um, I've been working closely with uh, a new friend of mine called Graham Nichols, who uh, trains people in out-of-the-body experiences. And I know that Graham has had, prove, has had at least one proven precognitive out-of-the-body experience that was actually proven. Because people, when he came back, he, he told people he saw the, the bombing in uh, Soho that happened in 1999 with the, the Admiral Benbow pub, I think it was. That's right, it was. In, in Old Compton Street. Yep. And he actually was in an out-of-the-body state. He went into, he was in a, with a group of people, he went into an out-of-the-body state. While he was in the out-of-the-body state, he was standing at the corner of the street where the pub was. He realized that something strange was happening and he knew it was precognitive because he tells me that everything goes a shade of blue, which, which is quite intriguing. And I'm not quite sure what that means. But he said that as he was looking down the street, he saw an explosion and the pub explode. He then came out of it and came to. Uh, and when he came to, the first thing he said to his, the people around him was, I've just had a precognitive out of the body experiences. I was in London and I've just witnessed a terrorist attack in Soho. That was five days before the actual terrorist attack took place. Now, to me, that is powerful, powerful proof that we, that the consciousness is not rooted within the brain. It can actually get information. But this is intriguing because this is information he received from the future. And what does that tell us about time as well? So we, so th this is a, an intriguing area, and I believe lucid dreaming is linked to all this. I think when people become lucid when they're dreaming, where do they go? What place do they go? And indeed, in my next book, I want, I want to discuss the light you see by when you're dreaming. Where does that light come from? And I believe that light comes from deep within the subatomic world. It comes from something, again, called the zero-point field, and it's something called bioluminescence. And it is something, it's, it's light that comes from DNA itself. <laughs> Incredible. Um, okay, uh, websites as well. What is your website? Because we haven't uh, mentioned that neither. 
Yeah, okay, it's anthonypeak.com. That's Anthony with an H and P E A K E dot com. Um, and also check me out on uh, Facebook. Uh, you'll find me as Anthony Peak on Facebook. I have two Facebook sites I have Anthony Peak and I have Anthony Peak Writer. That's where everything tends to happen. I also have a very, very active international forum, which is called cheatingtheferryman.com. Um, cheatingtheferryman.com, and you register to join that. But join me on Facebook. It's great on there. We we have I have literally thousands of people involved in there, and we have some fascinating people involved. Um, join me. You know, if you agree with what I'm saying, fine. But I'm not looking for agreements. I'm looking for people to go out there and actually present support or not to it. So if you feel that what I'm talking is nonsense, that's great. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to prove anything. All I'm trying to find is, is the truth. You know, what is really happening? What is really involved in there? So join me. You know, the, the, the water is very warm in there. Well, we're going to put all the links um, onto the um, on our website as well. Um, and I'd just like to say, um, Anthony P, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. OK, well, stay tuned as on the second half of the show, I'll be joined by Suzanne Axis, who calls herself the Gap Coach, because it's her mission to help you choose and close the gap between who you think you are and who you really are. So stay tuned. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website.